Um, I'd like to acknowledge some contributions to this talk. Uh, it's been co-built co really with a group of students who have just finished their degree in the area in which I teach. I'm a media and communications academic. I work in faculty. I have experience working in a support unit, but I'm primarily engaged in being the person uh, about whom I think many of you talk. What can we do to get academics to do this better? What can we do to get academics to do things properly? Um, and I'm very sensitive to that because I think uh, there are many disconnects on a university campus, and one of them is around the question of actual academic practice. So I'm here to talk as a discipline academic about how things are working for students that I've had the privilege to be engaged with uh, recently. I'm going to talk about curriculum in terms of a metaphor that I'm currently uh, thinking about quite hard, the maze, and I'm going to introduce you to some sets of practices that students engage in, which I'll describe as the shortcut and the network. And I'm interested in seeing if we can do slightly better as universities at reflecting and recognising the strategies that students bring to their experience of being with us. And to do that, perhaps we need to unthink our great fondness for the painting. Uh, in the course of this talk, I'm going to show three very short YouTube videos. I work at the University of Toronto, and I'm fairly confident that this will require me to enter the password at some point. I want to start with these. This is a particularly beautiful one. And there are lots of YouTube videos about this, including videos of people making it. I think it's a particularly apt metaphor for curriculum in the mind of the person. The maze itself is an exquisite piece of curriculum design. It's designed by a Danish group of architects called the and it's located in a building that has a very obvious history and historical work. What interests me is the way in which the building and its historical dimensions impose the constraints that cause the maze to be the shape that it is. And what interests me further is that what we really can't see is Washington. We can't see the city that extends beyond the maze that is nested inside the historic building. And I think this is a reasonably apt metaphor for curriculum nested inside the historic structure of the higher education. We make places. In thinking about this, I'm going to turn to a very well known on uh, reflective practice. But what's less well known about Donald Chern is that he was an engineer, so he was primarily concerned with engineering practices and principles. And in his 1994 book on design, he said that there were three critical tiers to design. And as curriculum designers, I think we might think about this. The most basic practice of design involves the designer and her materials and her intended object. The designer works alone under those circumstances. But in most forms of complex design that are institutionally housed, we move up to the second level, which is the level at which the designing system consists of all of the different stakeholders involved in design and their interactions with the constraining instruments that they find in their circumstances, policy objects, regulations of various kinds, expectations that are imposed upon them that the designed thing should look a certain way. And of course, once you create a designing system, you create the context for contestation. People almost immediately fall out over how things should be done. And in this, Donald Schoen says, this is inevitably political. And one of the things that makes this political is because it introduces public opinion to the practice of design. Design itself, the design of a university degree, the design of a university system, is something that is subjected to continuous public scrutiny. And I want to give you an example that you'll be familiar with. At the moment in Australia, we are in a blizzard of white papers. And white papers, I think, are possibly authored by people who prefer to read things that look a bit like this. So we're also in a blizzard of infographic, um, a sort of perfect storm of infographics at the moment. And in design terms, this infographic is particularly irritating. It's designed to elevate the sense of crisis within which we try to go about our work. So large words like disappearing and this kind of odd little robot that's coming for all of our jobs. 
And this, this, this idea that, that we are already failing to support the young people to whom we're committed, we're already letting them down in relation to this rapidly automating future. The report from which this was drawn is actually quite thoughtful on many points. So I'm really focusing on the infographic as an attempt to communicate in, in the face of public opinion what it is that universities are largely doing wrong. I'm just going to move my scarf because I sense I'm creating a kind of rustling. Um, and I just want to get a bugbear of mine out of the way. I was cheering when Ron Barnett said yesterday that student satisfaction are the weasel words of our time. If I had one thing that I would like to do to reform higher education, it would be that anyone who's writing a strategic plan should pay a small fine when they say real world. <laughs> and they should have to pay it twice if they put real world in quotes. When we say we are not part of the real world, we are sending students a powerful message about ourselves as organisations, ourselves as citizens, but overwhelmingly about them. We are telling them that the part of them that exists in this world that we consider to be more real than this one is of no interest to us because it's on the outside. And here I draw on uh, French philosopher Jacques Derrida. Now, Derrida is not everyone's cup of tea, uh, quite a lot of the time also not mine, but in this essay on the structure and opportunities of the unconditional university, which he makes clear is really the less conditional university, that's what we're really pitching for, but in this essay he says very beautifully that it's on the border between what we do and what we could imagine ourselves doing, that the university is right in the world that it is attempting to think. And I don't think we could put it much more clearly than that. This is another thinker who's been enormously important to my understanding of how curriculum actually gets made. Henry Giroux is a critical ped pedagogy theorist and I know that many of you are familiar with his work. And this is from a, a fairly early set of thoughts around this question, but it's a statement that I have never found to be um, less than helpful in deciding what to do next, in design, designing an assessment or grading something or thinking about how curriculum might be straightened out a bit. Shiru requires us to recall that our visions, which belong to us, weigh heavily on the lives of others and particularly weigh heavily on their futures. And I think this is a terrific statement and I think that if we use this as our compass when we make curriculum, by and large we make better curriculum. So I started to think about what our vision is, and I did a Google search, like all of our students, and I Googled university student, and these are the top 12 image search results for university student. And there are pages and pages and pages of them, and they look exactly the same. They are transfixing in their failure to represent the students that we teach. Uh, by and large, actually, because I know a bit about how the University of Wollongong represents students, they hire actual students and then kind of glamorise them to make them look more studenty for the potential <laughs> student market. So I actually teach a student whose face is currently on a Wollongong bus and she says, I just can't, I can't get on that bus. <laughs> so what you'll notice about these students is that they're mostly female, there is a nod in the direction of diversity and they represent their studentness on campus only. They're not studying at home, they're not studying at work, and when they're on campus they kind of hug their books in this really special way. <laughs> and when they're finishing they wave their test aimers, kind of hopefully, and, and this is how we communicate to the public that this is what we do, and this is who we do it for. But there's also this, which is as true of our students. This is 2014 large sample data, 34,000 students across many Canadian institutions. I'm not going to read this out, I, I, I think we just need to sit with it. This is the reality behind those Google image searches. People who are feeling absolutely desperate as they pass through their university experience, unsure about the present, unsure about the future, unsure about how to move from where they are now to this future of rapidly disappearing jobs. I think this is a staggering set of numbers. So this means we need to think again about the kinds of people that end up in the maze that we design and instead of seeing them as large cohorts, we need to see them as complex individuals 
only living a part of their life inside this maze. Many things are happening outside of the part of their life that we like to think that we design with good curriculum. And one of the things that we do with curriculum, I think, and we have to take some responsibility for this, is we cause them to run into each other. We cause them to become part of one another's lives. And sometimes we can see that that works exceptionally well, and we like to say, well, they met and they became friends and they did group work. But sometimes we can also see that they do harm to one another and they contribute to one another's low self-esteem and they don't make things better, they do make things worse and we don't really know how to help. I'm going to attempt to show you a video. Let's see what happens. I feel optimistic. I'm going to let that play in silence. What we do, this is a video of the big maze in the National uh, Building Museum actually being built. And I watch this over and over. It's a minute of uh, designing system activity. And I think this is me and my colleagues. This is me and all of you. This is us trying to make a better maze, a more progressive maze, a maze that has more exciting design features. And we work all together and we've got all different skills and we do this and then we do that and then we wait. And then people come and they walk through the maze and we sort of hope that they're having a fabulous experience. Actually the sweetest thing that happened in this maze was that a man proposed to his girlfriend by the time she finally made it to the middle. And this was being filmed from one of those overhead balconies and he's standing there for a really long time with the rose and the girls who are, who are filming it saying, I'm going to cry, I'm definitely going to cry. But she takes so long to get through the maze to find him that there's a sense of sort of anxious fatigue about her progress. And finally she makes it there and there's people peering over the walls trying to record this with their smartphones and it's actually a very beautiful but peculiar thing. And we call this in higher education a comprehensive approach that optimises the curriculum as a structure for student <laughs> learning and experience. So what does it mean that we think that we're responsible for structuring experience? We're not wedding planners. So let's have a think about what we do when we perform that kind of um, imposition in other people's lives. Let's not say it again. This is a statement about the maze made by its architect and it's a statement that really caught my eye for a very obvious reason if you know anything about critical theory. As you travel deeper into a maze, he said happily, your path ordinarily becomes convoluted. Well, we don't want a convoluted path, that's not a good thing. So what if we change the way that the maze is designed and we make a panopticon that brings clarity and visual understanding to the heart of the labyrinth? Now I think that there are people involved in the review and transformation of curriculum in higher education that might think this sounds like a good thing. What if we create a panopticon? Okay, let's take a look at that. Let's think about that a bit seriously for a moment. Um, Michel Foucault's beautiful work on panopticism looked back at the history of prisons that were designed in this particular way. The great efficiency of the panoptic prison was that it enabled a large number of prisoners to be efficiently surveilled by a very small number of staff. This will resonate in higher education, I think. And the efficiency of the panopticon is that the prisoners regulated themselves. At this point you might be thinking about MOOCs. Foucault broadened his analysis initially. In fact, he was looking at how we quarantine people under plague circumstances, but he then looked at prisons and finally said, look, really, this is a metaphor. All of these things are metaphors. What we're really talking about is large systems that require people to be pushed through certain processes with some degree of efficiency, and the panoptic schema works like nobody's business in all of these. What if we create a panopticon? So I'm, I'm just, again, moving these scars for you. Um, these, uh, this is the words of one of the students who has co-created this talk with me. And he wrote to me and he said, actually, uh, no, I think this is on his blog, he said, in fact, universities are more similar to prisons than I had ever assumed. And one of the beautiful things that this student taught me, some of you I'm sure know this, but it was new to me and I was kind of uh, really stuck with how horrid it is. The word deadline, comes to us from a prison situation. 
The deadline was the uh, light and flexible boundary placed around prisoners of war in the US Civil War in many different contexts. The deadline originated in situations of uncertainty when a small number of guards had to be able to regulate a large number of prisoners. So they established a line and if a prisoner went past it, he could be shot with impunity. And that's where we get the word deadline from. But Foucault joins with Schoen here on an important point that I think we need to hang on to, that the whole point of the panopticon wasn't what was going on inside it, but it was that the panopticon as a whole enabled the exercise of power under the surveillance of public opinion. Society as a whole, anyone can come and look and see how things are being done. This is a very familiar feeling to our heavily audited sector. And I'm just going to show you an example of this, that's quite cutting edge for us, Quilt. Welcome to Quilt, where you can discover the quality of higher education institutions and the study areas they offer. Have you ever wished you could ask current or former students about their university experience? That's what we did. We asked over 100,000 current students and new graduates about their experience of university. We captured their responses and present them here so that you can discover the real quality of higher education institutions and their study areas. You can discover the quality of an institution. Simply enter the institution's name into the search box and click go. Now you can see the experience of current undergraduates. Just take a look at that image. Now you can see the experience. There it is. This is the claim that analytics is making to us over and over and over again, that it's a reasonable proxy for human experience and if you have a bar chart, now you can see the experience. And through that lens, you can see the quality of the institution, all of the experiences that that institution consists of. You can see it right there. There's a particular kind of maze that gives people a whole lot of trouble, a glass maze. And a glass maze in some ways is the exemplar of the perfect curriculum. There's no obstruction, you can see where everyone is. Um, you can see the experience that other people are having and this will surely guide you if there are no walls between you and the other people inside the curriculum. In fact, if you Google uh, videos of glass maze, you Google people becoming psychically distressed, especially small children, banging into things, unable to go where they can see that they should be able to go because someone else has gone there, except bang, and it gets worse if you introduce mirrors. And in fact, there are very long videos of people trying to find their way out of glass mazes. So maybe we need to think again before we think about the glass maze as the exemplar of curriculum. Architects think a lot about the question that perplexes humans when they're faced with complex structures like a maze. Bill Hillier, who's the author of a beautiful book on space as a kind of machine, introduces something that's very important for us as curriculum designers, the question of intelligibility. He says, there's structure of a thing and function of a thing, and between the two is the intelligibility of the thing. And the intellig intelligibility is, when you get there, can you figure out how it works quickly? Because if you can't, you will become distressed and confused. This is, uh, again, the voices of my students. Uh, one remembered being given a map that she carried with her for three years, a paper map and at the beginning of every semester she tried to figure out where to go. I'm tremendously interested in this because this is the map at the entrance to the big maze and if you study the big maze from above you can see that this is not a map to that maze. It's a map to the general maziness of mazes. It simply says mazes look a bit like this, go through that door. And I think that's actually what we do with students all of the time. When we transition them in we say universities are like this, go through that door. But what we're really interested in is making sure that they don't leave. <laughs> Speaking of experiences that are difficult to leave, who recognises this? It's IKEA. It's a heat map of how people walk through IKEA. And in some ways you would think in a university setting that IKEA would be the exemplar of good maze design because it's really difficult to go backwards in IKEA. It's really, you're under so much social pressure in IKEA 
it's really hard to get it wrong. But still, IKEA provides you with this map, which is a gross oversimplification of the complexity of making your way around IKEA with other people. And this is in fact how IKEA gets it done. They get it done with arrows on the floor, because by the time you're in IKEA, you can't remember what the map said. So you just blunder along and you follow everybody and just when you're thinking, am I going the right way because I went to look at a sofa and now I don't know which way I'm facing, <laughs> there's an arrow on the floor. And this arrow on the floor is a powerful corrective pedagogy, particularly you'll notice here there's someone going the wrong way. And this person is shortly going to be turned around and sent <laughs> in the right direction. Not just by the arrow, but by the arrow and everyone else who's following it. That is exactly how curriculum works. So I asked students how they learnt how to navigate the IKEA of their higher education experience and they said, oh, I sort of learnt by experience. And what you can hear here is often learnt by quite bad experience. Tried a thing, went around a corner, couldn't get back, got in trouble, failed something, failed a prerequisite for something. Having failed a prerequisite, had to negotiate with someone, still had to go back and get the prerequisite in first year, that just before graduating in third year. What's that even about? Never learned it after four years. But the reason why I think we should really love IKEA as a model for curriculum is that it's scaffolded. It's in three stages. <laughs> so it's perfect, highly regulated at the beginning, beginning to kind of branch out and really think what you came here to do in the middle, and by the end, flat pack furniture, take it home and make it work. And this maps exactly onto the University of Wollongong's curriculum transformation framework, just like that. Now, it's easy to say that we should be looking askance at design because there are examples of design that you know, annoy us all. But the most important thing here is the research into this. Alan Penn is an emeritus professor of space design. He's the professor of IKEA studies. Alan Penn has spent a lot of time in IKEA. And he comes to this conclusion that despite all of the indicators of very high levels of intelligibility, IKEA is in fact unintelligible as a human system and it's unintelligible because it's disorienting and it removes autonomy. It's precisely the qualities that appear to give IKEA its robustness as an intelligible spatial design that made people hate it. And Alan Payne and his postgraduate students have interviewed lots of people about going to IKEA and they all say the same thing. You have to submit, you have to give in, you have to do what they tell you. You can hear students say this in the course of their degrees because to do anything else is really difficult. So, the voices of my students again. One of the things that we do wrong when we design curriculum is that we assume students arrive tidily in year one and graduate in year three. But in fact, many students who are making their way through the maze of a particular curriculum have had a go at another couple before. So they're hardened to some extent to the way universities work and they're having their third go. This is a student who has just finished but he tried two other degrees before finding the one that he could understand that was intelligible to him. And the real consequence of this wasn't in his university experience, it was in Centrelink. This really should make us think. And so how do students seek help? We pride ourselves on providing lots of help. We provide lots of touch points for help help seeking behaviours. We reward them all around the website and sometimes on campus and in fact they say, I had no idea, I had no idea but I sort of felt I'd probably been told in first year, they gave me a map when I entered IKEA, I'd been told in first year so I didn't want to go and ask. In other words, we prevent help seeking behaviour by saying, by signing off on providing the information and then they don't want to go and ask because they feel that they should know. But whoever reads the terms and conditions? And so instead, when they're in the maze and they're passing other people, they hear, they overhear conversations from people they don't know particularly well. They overhear a conversation in a coffee lineup that says, don't you know, the degree's changed. And now there are these changed conditions and didn't you know that? And they become annoyed and they feel distressed and they're less forgiving to the structure of the maze and to the other people in it. Because something's happened, but no one's told them what it was. And actually, very poignantly, they say, this feels really strange. It's strange that this is so inflexible. Simon Barron is a writer who writes about mazes and labyrinths and I was very taken with this simple statement. 
people who like mazes, so that the important thing about mazes is that they build puzzle-solving capability and they directly support the development of resilience. If you can keep figuring out how to backtrack and have another go and you make your way through a maze, you can often feel really positive about it. But Simon Barron says, actually, some people really don't. You put them in a labyrinth and they stop moving. This is a beautiful short video made by the American educator Mike Wesch, who some of you will know. Uh, he's done a number of uh, YouTube videos, but this one is very beautiful, and it's called The Sleeper. I am pretty sensitive to student reactions in my classes. For better or worse, I really feed off of them. I had one student who was just always sleeping. If he wasn't sleeping, he was giving me this strange, dreadful look. And here I was, armed with a dazzling HD screen with 2,073,600 points of light and a laser pointer, and I just couldn't get through to him. Actually, I had four screens. I mean, I tried everything, and the more I threw myself into it, the more it hurt. Every time I saw him, I couldn't help but think, I must be really boring. Nothing I do or say matters. This class is meaningless. I'm wasting everybody's time. Sometimes I just get mad. And who does he think he is? One day I just had enough, and I was just ready to, I don't know. And I went up to him and I said, do you want to go to lunch? I asked him why he sleeps in my classes, and he started to describe his addiction to games. But it's more than that. He doesn't just play them, he makes them. He started describing a complex game he invented that used mythological heroes on hexagon cards that created what he called a fog of war game mechanic. I couldn't quite see it all, but I did see something else. I saw somebody who could, would, and has thrown themselves into meaningful creative projects. I found someone who has been mishandled, mistreated, and underappreciated by an education system focused on frustratingly narrow pursuits. So I invited him to be part of a different kind of class. No PowerPoints, no lectures, no textbooks, no syllabus, no grades. A class where students are respected for their strengths and given a chance to discover them. Because that's the real tragedy. It's not just that I saw David in a certain way. It's that he saw himself that way too. But after watching him work day and night on our project to create a game, I see him and other sleepers a little differently. This is the story of one of my students who uh, I think was a sleeper and is now going to be uh, working on making resources for other students who suffer from depression. And he wanted to explain his behaviour in the class that other people had often found uh, suggested that he wasn't paying attention. And he wasn't paying attention because he was holding himself so tightly. He was managing himself so closely. And I do want to stress all of these words are used with the student's permission. They knew who I was talking to and they wanted you to know these things. And he said, I used to go into parent mode myself and I used to become polite and respectful compared to the normal me. There was no room in our system for the normal him that couldn't give two shits about anything anymore. And people asked him what was wrong with him when his normal and our normal didn't work together well. And now he says he seems to understand it. And this student, who also came to university with a diagnosis of some significance and found herself incapable, incapable of meeting deadlines, deadlines really began to make her struggle. But she only had that experience in her last semester. She'd managed it all the way to that point, and suddenly at the end, it all fell over. And one late hand in turned into another and then another, and then she couldn't do anything at all. And she became ill. She became physically ill. And she still had to work six days a week as a full-time student. That is paid employment of six days a week. And she's never been closer to dropping out, she said. And this student said, I have depression and anxiety. And some days I can't even get out of bed. So the mere thought of the work ahead of me causes me to shut down and block it out as though it never existed. And this is the real one. Shame is the big problem. So for all of you who've tried to find a student who hasn't met a deadline and has apparently vanished, they're not drinking cocktails by the pool. They're at the bottom of the bed, covered in shame. And they can't answer email and they can't speak. They can't let you find them. Because in their head somewhere, there's still a narrative that it's all going to work out. 
if they can only get out of bed. And what he says here is, what you are trying to achieve is to fit yourself into a system. And some of them make it through. I think she's right to be proud of this, but I'm not so sure that we are right to celebrate her graduation. I'm not so sure that we're right to be proud of the situation that we put her in. So, just quickly, the strategies that students use. All university campuses have these on them. They're called desire lines, goat tracks, elephant paths, social paths, cow paths, vernacular trails. They're the pathways made by people in a hurry for whom the designed path doesn't work correctly. And at the University of Wollongong, this is a goat track that connects our terrible parking system as a community, community university with our educational system. So students drive round and round and round the campus looking for a park, and when they finally find a park, because they've driven down from Sydney, they finally find a park and they're late. And together, without ever speaking, they have made this path that makes it four seconds quicker to get to class late. And this has a long history. Back in Kent State in 1962, the exact same thing was happening. So this is a socially consistent event. Kent State University said, time-conscious students cutting corners, breaking through hedges all over the campus. And my favourite thing about this particular incident, there's a beautiful newspaper article that goes with it, is that the head of buildings and grounds at Kent State University was called Mr Wooddell. <laughs> and Mr Wooddell tried and tried and tried. He put hedges in their way. He built new hedges so they couldn't get through the hedges. And he said, new shortcuts are continually developing. <laughs> and in fact, this is exactly what happens today. <laughs> this is a shortcut that developed and was struck down by the University of Wollongong over maybe a four-year period. Every time it rained, the shortcut re-emerged. And finally, in desperation, we put a sign on it that said, no access, grounds under repair. This is how students take shortcuts. If the lecture's compulsory and I've got something else to do, I get a friend to sign me in. I was hearing recently that this may be treated as a form of academic fraud. Good Lord. Uh, I never went to lectures because I listened on EduStream and also the other shortcut with EduStream is listening to it at double speed. I, I listened to this kind of chipmunk version of my lecture and it was easier to stay home because I was doing something else. And I never did the readings and nobody noticed that and nobody called me out on it and I got mark good marks anyway. I did the maths on what I needed to get a pass. Hurrah! I did subjects all out of order. I did the boring things first. I ate the vegetables before the dessert. So no matter whether they were 200 level or 300 level, I did them all first to get the boring things out of the way early and to speed up. Now, in fact, what the University of Wollongong eventually did with that particular desire path is that they paved it. Uh, they became so exasperated with the effort of protecting that bit of grass, which was peculiarly badly designed. And in fact, that particular path was being mown into the turf by the uh, administration staff, because it connects the administration staff who have a very short coffee break to the nearest coffee outlet. And they didn't have the time. And hats off to them, it's now much easier. So the second thing that students do, they develop networks. And networks are very fashionable in curricular thinking at the moment, and we like to imagine that we design for networked practices and network knowledge. Connectivist learning theory is all about the network. And I just want to suggest that sometimes the experience of being in networks is patchy and incomplete and sometimes slightly isolating. Nevertheless, the students told me that as they came to university, because they were very often from local families, an older sibling had come first, or someone they knew from school was already here, and this is something that's really critical about regional universities, they had expertise to draw on. So they asked friends who'd been around for a long time, and they asked someone else who'd switched a degree what, what they could get away with. So the network and the shortcut working closely together here. Again, friends, but sometimes that doesn't always work out because your friends aren't really necessarily always doing the same thing as you. So a student who came much younger than all his other friends didn't have a network when he came here and he felt that isolation all the way through. But critically, again, in relation to help-seeking behaviour, I never bothered to go see people at uni when I needed help because I'm not here very often. These are the stories of full-time students. 
this is something we really need to take into account. I don't have time to waste going and seeing someone. So I had friends, but they were doing something else. And in fact, the student reflected with me, I'm overly independent, I don't like asking for help. And so in fact, she went through her degree with a great deal of um, capability in overhearing things, is, is how I would put it, in the maze. So in conclusion, I just want to look at uh, some I an idea that comes to us from urban planning as a way that we might resolve all of this. The urban theorist Jane Jacobs, who wrote The Life and Death of American Cities in the 1960s, made this simple statement, we can't make community without networks. So networks are evidently very important to the community experience of higher education students, their resilience and their well-being. And Jacobs' work has fed into an urban planning model called fused grid planning. And when I look at this relative to the big maze and the IKEA maze and the curriculum that we design, I see something that speaks to the concerns that Ron Barnett raised yesterday about space to think. Fused grid neighbourhood planning is based on the idea that all roads connect to all other roads and they are uh, surrounded by open spaces where people walk on pathless parts of the neighbourhood. They make the paths that they want to make. They come there in their own time if they need to sit, if they need to bring a friend. This is what they do with the open parts of their neighbourhood. And by so doing, we may be able to think about making curriculum into a walkable neighbourhood rather than a maze. And the consequence is this. This is a, a, a part of Santiago that's been designed according to this principle. Jane Jacobs says about this principle, if the mixtures, the design mixtures that we use are to be more than a friction on maps, what they need is different people doing different things, appearing at different times on the same streets. I think that's a beautiful way to think about curriculum. And just this morning, Stephen Downs, uh, educational theorist, uh, ed tech, uh, rule breaker in many ways, one of the people who innovated the term MOOC, said, here we are now in 2015, it's been seven years since the first MOOC, and we're now asking, is community a kind of course? Does a course have to have a curriculum? Does it have to have objectives or involve an instructor or be based in a single institution? Really what it comes down to is this, a course has value in creating temporary networks and temporary associations that increase diversity and improve the chance of serendipity. And I want the final word to go to the students who contributed to this talk. I asked them, in relation to serendipity, what had most surprised them as they were readying themselves to exit the university? And these are very beautiful, positive, assertive things. I don't think we claim the credit for them. I think the credit is due to them. And I'm really delighted that among the most disengaged says, I didn't think I'd miss it that much, but actually, you know, once you get to know people after three and a half years, you learn to miss it all. So I think, as a concluding thought, I think that we can, in some safety, start to undo the presumptions by which we design curriculum, because we have great strengths in the student cohort that moves through their degrees with us. Thank you. Yeah, me too. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I was really, I was delighted to read that. I, I think that, um, I think over the next little while, we are going to have to do something about grades. I think that there are a strong disarticulation with the future of work. I think they prepare students extraordinarily badly for the workplace. And I think the kind of work that our students are going to find themselves doing, you know, there's evidence now that some graduates take five years to find a secure job. So they're going to be churning through a succession of precarious jobs. They're absolutely going to need to be able to evaluate and hold on to what is dear to them. 
grades undermine that capability to an extraordinary degree. But when we, whenever we think about it, perhaps we can manage something else. We look at all of the systems that we've developed that depend on students having grade averages and uh, being able to measure across, benchmark across institutions. We have become functionally addicted to grades and it's doing incredible harm. So I think the fact that students are surviving this is tremendous. I think we're going to have to change our practice. Jeanette, there's someone there. extensively to students who have overcommitted to an extraordinary degree is that we're not ready to respond because we haven't listened. So we can observe the behaviour and we can observe the impact of the behaviour. So we can observe that they're engaging in some kind of things that are a planning nightmare for anyone. Then we can observe that they're not showing up in class and then we can respond to that. But that's not actually what's happening. What's happening is a whole range of things that fit outside of our system that we need to understand, you know, why are they taking on those very high levels of employment. One of the things that students have told me is that employers are very directly saying to them, I will be able to replace you if you don't come in. And so they're not at risk simply of not taking that shift, they're at risk of losing their job. And <coughs> under those circumstances, they're making practical, sensible adult decisions about the income that enables them not only to be at university, but many of them are critical rent payers in their family household. So they can't just say, well, actually, I'm just not going to do it. They're not working for fun. You know, they, they're working because they have to. So I, I think you're right. I think we're completely failing to understand this. Um, it's a sort of basic user ethnography that we're not doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, it was very inspiring, but, but um, picking up on something that was said in response to, to the, our first keynote at this conference, and that is, um, uh, is it not the case that life is a maze anyway, and therefore by entering a maze at a certain kind of maze, people are being trained to deal with maze at the university level, which then prepares people for, for the mazes, all the mazes beyond you know, I, I, I understand why that's an important question, but I, I actually just don't think it's the case that life is a maze to the extent the curriculum is a maze. I think life is a space, and it's a space filled with decisions, so it's a space filled with forking paths, and a, a maze replicates that in some ways. I mean, that's why mazes are kind of ancient forms, because they replicate the dilemma of decision-making at all, and out in the world we make decisions. But I think life is much more complicated and porous, so um, I, I sort of mentioned that I might sort of speak about porosity in this talk, which I didn't really, but I think life is much more porous than a maze. A maze is designed to keep everybody inside. Which is, I mean, I think we have to be clear, that's our business goal. When we talk about retention and attri attrition and retention, we're not talking about the impact on students. We're talking about the impact on our revenue stream in a particularly awful way. And so we, we build mazes because it keeps everyone in. Uh, just like IKEA do. IKEA refer to it as a sales funnel. And I think our curriculum is a sales funnel.
about the maze is it is a designed object but the labyrinth isn't always and the model that has preoccupied educational theorists for a bit now is the rhizome so the idea of a naturally occurring formation that creates its own branching paths and appears to have no central form of authorization to do so and, and the uh, people who are devotees of rhizomatic learning feel very strongly that it's this um, open and natural and organic pattern of growth that, that we should turn to when we try to understand human networks. So human networks and networks of consequence in the way that people relate to one another are themselves organic patterns and the rhizome is the one that drives people's thinking there. Um, and, and interestingly, people who are really into the rhizome are really against trees. They feel very strongly about that. Um, I think uh, spaces, I, I think that if you look at a space like this, I mean a space like this is, is designed to create all of the discomforts that all of you are feeling and trying to have a conversation with all of you facing the same direction. And um, it kind of drives me mad in universities that we're asked to use spaces like this to create uh, networks and communities of practice where people feel dear to one another and they're all looking at the backs of each other's heads. And I think we'll stop building spaces like this if you want us to do that. Because this space showcases the product. And the product is the salaried staff and the content. And that's the least interesting thing in a university. But you wouldn't know it from the architecture. Great question. It's an extraordinarily interesting question. Our car parks are full of cars, but I don't think that means that people really super enjoy parking. It's just that that's what, what they've got. Um, but IKEA is really interesting about this. Research into IKEA shows that people come out having made a, a, a measurable proportion of purchases that they didn't intend to make when they went and that they regret. <laughs> and that it's uh, because the extreme directional nature of the funnel means that when they see it, they make an impulse buy because they're afraid of not being able to get back to it. <laughs> and that is a metaphor for prerequisites in the curri curriculum. Grab it now, because you might need it later, and you come out with a toilet brush and that wasn't what you needed. <laughs> um, and so I think IKEA is very good at doing something, and IKEA is full of people. That doesn't necessarily mean that the people like the thing that IKEA is very good at doing, but more, as, as Alan Penn's research showed, they accept it. They accept it as a given that if you want to come out, and there is no other competitor for IKEA in cheap flat pack furniture. 
If you want to come out with cheap flat pack furniture, furniture and a meatball, IKEA is the place to go. <laughs> so I think they have a monopoly. And that means actually they could design it that you would have to make your way through it in a you know, mud maze. And if people really wanted what there was, they would do it. I think what IKEA have developed in their, their sales funnel design, which is the same the world over, just like McDonald's, what they've developed is an idea of least objectionable design. It's what people will put up with. And I think that's what we do in universities too. students doing a terrific job of this. I think that, that while we're not looking, they're removing several panels and making uh, more direct and more interesting pathways. But at tremendous cost to themselves in, in terms of hex. So the student who takes three degrees to get themselves settled graduates with a hex debt that is really daunting. And I sat with him when he calculated his hex debt. Um, so, should we, I think we should. I think we should make more space. I, I think Ron Barnett's exactly right, but when I think about this as a curriculum designer and I think about the constraints on me as a curriculum designer and it's got to have subject level outcomes and it's got to map to course level outcomes and da 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 da, I find myself surrounded by panes of glass. So I think it takes a little courage, I think it does. I think courage and common purpose, but the students are already burrowing underneath the glass panels and breaking them. I think Ruth had a question. Yeah. Uh, I really had a comment just to extend the IKEA metaphor as well. And one of the problems with IKEA is that a lot of the, the, the products are quite disposable break down. So we're actually stand up the landfill, the mattresses and the sofas and things that after five or ten years, we're actually causing an environmental problem with the amount of furniture that we're, we're going through again and again. Um, okay. So that's also potentially putting that metaphor, you know, that what are they ending up? But look at that. Where that really works for me is that the, um, the whole kind of proposition, the IKEA proposition of the first third, the first year, if you like, the transition year, is these complete lifestyle packages. So the complete bathroom and the complete 50 square meter house and, and all of these things. And actually that en encourages you to consume the things that you didn't come there to get because they match. And by those means you end up with a surfeit of things. And I think this is also educationally true. We say to everybody, no matter what their professional future, your degree will be a complete showroom, uh, and it's this big. And you'll have a ton of things in there that you won't ever even remember doing. But we make you do a certain number of credit points, and we make that take a certain amount of time, and we make you graduate with the whole showroom. And I think there is a tremendous wastage in that. Uh, uh, really one that is on us in terms of environmental management of people's time. If we are wasting people's time because it's better for us that they're here for the whole three years, maybe we should give them more space to do things with that time that suits them. I'm just conscious of taking up your reflection time, so... Um, I'm loving the defiance of the microphone. I think this is great. Okay. Um, thank you for that. It was visually intriguing and intellectually intriguing as well. Being a person who doesn't shop about here, that I have to be a while. I think this is going to cause universities tremendous grief 
over the next three to five years, I think MOOCs and badges together. Uh, MOOCs have got over, you know, their initial um, overstatement of, of brilliance, I think. Um, and badges were always a more modest proposition, but they tailor extremely well to the world of work. And as they become, with every year, progressively more refined and capable as ways of uh, allowing people to have education that is absolutely tapping into what they need it to do, I think MOOCs and badges will cause the traditional business model some anxiety. When I watch my kids, my youngest daughter is 10, if she wants to know how to do something in Minecraft, she goes to YouTube and she looks it up. And with the video playing beside her, she achieves the goal. And she's going to be, I think, the people of her generation, the iPad kids, are going to be fairly astonished by this architecture. And they're going to be very astonished by the idea that in the first year of their degree, they're going to learn something that we're going to tell them is going to be useful to them, maybe in five years' time. I can't think of a profession that doesn't move in five years, that doesn't absolutely change what students need to do. So I think badges and moats are, are going to be much, much more threatening than we have allowed. And I think that's a good thing, actually. I mean, I'm not a fan of moats at all, but that's only just as they are now. Uh, but I think change is coming. Well, thank you, Kate. It was Thanks, Jeanette.